Hi, I'm Dave Rogers. I'm a policy advisor with Nova Vermont, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. This is another um, episode in a series of discussions about current policy issues of interest to Vermont and of importance to Vermont uh, agriculture and food systems. Uh, today our discussion was prompted by uh, the plans to uh, put in place a, a, a gas pipeline. Vermont Gas Systems is uh, is uh, in the process of getting public approval for an extension of, of their gas pipelines, and this raises all sorts of questions about uh, effects on climate change, uh, our energy future, uh, agriculture, agricultural lands. And so we have a couple of guests here today who, will, who have been involved with this issue and, this, uh, uh, and have been working to uh, uh, address the concerns of communities and of others. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, Andy Simon from uh, 350 Vermont and, uh, and uh, Nate Palmer from Laughing Tree Farm in Moncton. So I'll just welcome. Uh, and here. Perhaps, you could, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, about your uh, organizations, what your involvement has been with this, uh, and uh, the kind of work you do. Andy? Um, we, this is 350 Vermont is a grassroots climate action organization based in Burlington. We um, have been working on primarily on the issue of the tar sands pipeline in the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, the uh, Portland Montreal pipeline that's owned by Exxon Mobil, and the plan to working building a web of opposition to the plan to reverse that pipeline, uh, which currently runs from east to west, and and um, the plan to turn it around, run it from west to east, and run uh, tar sands products from from Western Canada through it. Um, that's what we've been working on, but there's a direct connection between that and this natural gas plan that we'll get into later. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've been uh, working at and supporting the, uh, the organizing around the gas pipeline as well. Okay, good. Nate? Well, I uh, run a small farm, a laughing tree farm. It's 77 acres in, in Moncton, and uh, of course my history is a uh, been involved with a lot of uh, alternative energy projects and I think that the best thing that farms can do is to get where they're producing their own energy so that they're independent of the whole fossil fuel system. You know, why work so hard to go out and pay for your fuel when there's plenty of potentials to make your fuel on your own farm. So I've been involved in it from that angle for a long time and I've built my own still so I could run one of my tractors on alcohol and I've been looking at oil crops, I've bought pelletizers. So I could do hay pelletizing, you know, to get biomass that way to run the boiler at the, at the house. So I was looking at originally from the alternative energy project and when I heard about Vermont Gas doing this build out, I thought, my God, this is going to just really smash alternative energy big time. And I started making calls to people that I know and because I was involved in the Vermont Biofuels Association about a few years ago when that was formed. So I'm calling people up saying, what do you think and how are we going to deal with this? And of course, still you know, the route went from where it was going to be over down through Route 7 in Shalott and North Ferrisburg to where suddenly it's coming through Hinesburg and Moncton and next thing you know they did a route change and it comes right through my backyard so I've gone from where I have issues with it on the fuel issue to where I have issues with it going through farmland and through my own property as well so wow. it was just kind of a call to action you know I was I was calling people saying you know you got to step up and do something and all of a sudden it's like wow I guess I'm the one who's got to step up and yeah. do something something so that's the angle that I started looking at it from and you know then of course when you realize it's coming through your own property and you know I'm not a certified organic farm but I've been farming organically ever since I've been there you know I've never put any chemicals on my property I make a heck of a good compost pile and you know I'm, I'm always looking at everybody else's manure pile it's like wow that would help my farm out a lot you know so when you've worked your soil and you're connected to your soil and all of a sudden you have this big project come through your backyard and they want to just rip your land up and put this pipe through it and is carrying a hazardous material and an energy form that's totally against you know the way you feel and you believe and it's just such you know an attack on you you think wow you gotta do something about it so I've been trying to talk to you know people like Andy and Vperg and Nofa and anybody I can get to say, you know, folks, we need to do something about this. This is just a lot bigger than any one person's farm, and 
of course, the more you get into it and the more you start checking the details, you know, the more stuff that comes up. It's like, you know, every project that I've ever dealt with in my life, I always look at it, you know, the positives and the negatives. And the more I look at the gas pr project, I just see more negatives and a whole lot less positives. And, you know, the, with me, the, my connection to the land, you know, I look down the pipeline to the other end of it, where this gas is coming from, you know, right. and I think, my well, I want to God, the that. damage they do there, it's like, we definitely, so many angles of this thing. Yeah, and you know, in a, in a, in a brief conversation, when we're not going to be able to do justice to all the yeah. important complexities of it, but uh, you just hit on some very important points that we're going to want to uh, pursue. So just, just to provide a little baseline information, so uh, this project is uh, a, propose, a proposal to extend an existing pipeline f up in northern Vermont uh, and run a, an extension, I think it's 40-some miles, from Colchester miles. to Middlebury. And this is called phase one of the project. It's going to be about a one-foot diameter pipe, correct? Yeah, 12 put, 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 down on, put down about three to five feet underground. And the challenge here for uh, communities and for gas, Vermont gas systems is to find a route that is feasible and acceptable to the communities. So that's called phase one, and it's in a rather late stage of, uh, uh, of consideration by the Public Service Board here in Vermont, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then there's a phase two of the project, which will, which will sort of kick off this fall. Uh, and that, that will take it from Middlebury down through Cornwall and Shoreham and then underneath Lake Champlain to International Paper uh, 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 um, plant. And then another phase that will take it down, uh, a third phase to Rutland and more phases yeah, phase ahead. Phase three is to Rutland and then phase four there's only a one sentence uh, mentioned in the whole original filing where they want to hook to the federal pipeline system yeah. over in the New York side. So, and there's no reference for sure as to whether it's going to be in Albany or Lake George mm -hmm. or where. So. so that route, the, the, the development of that route, whether or not the projects will go forward uh, will depend on the Public Service Board here in Vermont issuing a, a certificate of public good. But um, that will not happen unless and until an, a route has been approved. And that's a process that where there's a lot of public input. So uh, there are a lot of issues connected with this, the route, how it affects communities, how it affects the land. Um, another concern is the source of the gas. Uh, Andy, you said uh, that you know this is going to be bringing gas from the west. From Western Canada, that's it, bringing it in from Alberta, where they're fracking gas uh, in the same region that where they're extracting tar sands yes. oil from the from the land, so they're destroying the land in several different directions, as Nate was talking about. You know, if you look out there, if you look at what's going on out there, it's just horrifying. They've taken the, the yes. vast sections of the boreal forest and just stripped them right off. Um, for the for tar sands mining, it's an open pit process, um, and so they're just like stripping the land of the forest. They take every single bit of vegetation off of it um, and create these giant open pit mines. For fracking, uh, on the surface, it looks a little bit better. Uh, and same thing for uh, there's a fracking process where they get tar sand oil out as well for the deeper deposits. On the surface, you see a bunch of different uh, uh, sort of well heads yeah. around. But un under the surface, it's making terrible devastation. And in fact, for the, for the tar sands process, they just revealed um, <clears throat> a leak that's happening in, in Alberta that nobody knows this, the exact source of and nobody knows how to stop a, an oil leak that's so, happening in that, in that same area where they're extracting the, the, the fracked gas right now. So th there we have the, the beginning of the concerns. Where is this gas coming from? How is it being produced? And is it a responsible decision on the part of Vermont uh, communities and government to allow that gas to come here? Uh, now. Can I just say one more word yes. about that? Is that is that you know besides the obvious impact on the land, what's the impact on the on the communities out there is tremendous. These are mostly indigenous communities. They uh, uh, have been hunting and fishing in that land for a long time, and you know once you've stripped off all the vegetation and chased out all the wildlife from this 
this land, that, that just can't go on anymore. And they're totally in violation of the treaties that, the, that Canada has signed with, with those tribes, but they're just going ahead and doing it anyway. There's so much money at stake that they're just pushing aside any considerations um, like that. So the, these, uh, we'll stay, for a moment, we'll stay on this bigger picture. Uh, 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 and uh, we'll stay with you, Andy, for a minute, uh, because uh, there is um, the whole question and connection with extracting this gas, uh, shipping it uh, on climate change and uh, effects on climate change, uh, greenhouse gases and such. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the, the carbon footprint of this gas and of, of this pro larger project? And sure. That, well, I, you know, Vermont Gas and other gas producers and shippers are really fond of saying that it uh, uh, has less of an impact on greenhouse gas, gas emissions in, in, uh, in, in the world and in Vermont, and that will lower our, our carbon footprint. But that's from a very narrow perspective. It really is uh, just looking at what happens when you burn this fuel. So comparing, number two, uh, heating oil to... Uh, to natural gas when you burn it. In fact, there's about 30% less carbon emissions when you burn it. But uh, that doesn't look at the whole life cycle uh, picture of, of, the, of extraction, of transport, of uh, storage, and everything that leads up to uh, the point where it's actually coming into your, into your home or into mm -hmm. your vehicle or into whatever you're using it for. And if you compare it that way, if you really look at the whole life cycle, including all the leakage that's happening that's been acknowledged by the company um, of methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide by, by quite a number of factors. Most of, of this gas is methane, is that? Most of it is methane. It's yeah. like 99% methane. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when you look at that, it's actually a worse uh, fuel alternative uh, than coal. Huh. And coal, of course, is always stigmatized as the worst kind of fuel. Well, natural gas is really, from a life cycle point of view, it's really worse than coal. Because I know the, the gas company uh, says, hey, this is, this is a responsible approach to our energy future. And you're pointing out, if you look at the entire view, if you, add all, if you do the proper accounting, right. you'll find out that it's not at all a plus in that regard. That's what, what Vermont Gas has been able to do is they, they say, we're a distribution company and it's cleaner at the burner tip, you know, so they're, they're advertising the good part of it, but they don't want to bring along any of the bad bag baggage, right. you know. Oh, we're not really drilling for it, but, you know, you have to oh, be responsible for what they're doing, you know. And Vermont Gas is owned by Gas Metro, a Canadian company, which in turn is owned by... Uh, Enbridge. 30% of it is owned by Enbridge. Enbridge which also, same. do they own the tar sands? Is it, is they don't own, they know Enbridge is, the involvement with tar sands is as a shipper. They oh, okay. own, they're one of the biggest uh, pipeline companies in Canada. So they are, uh, they own part of the, the pipeline network, the transportation network that, ex that brings the, um, the tar sands oil uh, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know, to various places to ship it out. And they were the ones that were responsible for the, the giant uh, oil spill in Kalamazoo, Michigan, three years ago. Mm -hmm. That was Enbridge. Uh, Vermont Gas, uh, people think of it as a little local uh, or a, a, a Vermont concern, but it's got, it's really it's sort part of, of a, a part of a, a huge yeah. multinational type. It's like the fingertip structure. It's something yes. a lot bigger. You know? Which is also which is also part of the same corporate structure that Green Mountain Power is part of. So right. you start talking about wind turbines, which this is not about, but you know, when you, when you start looking at the corporate network, um, there's, it's hard to to pluck one string without having the whole thing Yes, yes, vibrate. that's the nature of our global. Yeah, uh, it's like you talk about energy independence in Vermont, and here we have one corporation that owns our gas and our electric utilities and the transportation lines, and you know, now wanting to expand the, the pipelines. How is that independent? You know, that's total right. dependency. Yes. You know, you can't be any more hooked up than having a pipe and electric line bringing everything to you. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting uh, observation that a couple of years ago the legislature banned fracking in Vermont. It was an easy decision. We don't have any frackable deposits, I guess. Yeah. They but, haven't discovered uh, them yet. But at, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we feel it's okay to have this wholesale fracking and, and very uh, irresponsible environmental practices um, someplace else as long as we get the gas at the other end. So. And we do have some options on gas leaks. And, uh, 
gas leases in the state. Back in, I think it was 72 or 3, they came through and checked for gas. And, oh, really? And, you know, yeah, the big old thumper trucks came right down Route 7 doing the seismic tests. And uh, they did a lot of leases and down through Shoreham and Cornwall and mm. down in that direction. And a lot of the farmers signed on because they said, oh, it's free money. You know, and the, at the time they said, oh, there's, there's gas deposits there, but it's not economically feasible to go mm. after it. Well, mm. in the 70s, they were saying the same thing in Demick. Hmm. You know, I mean, they've got a lot bigger play there. I mean, our gas is very spotty, but, you know, there's still the potential that eventually, if you get to the point where the price of the gas can be enough to make it worthwhile, there could be extraction here. Well, I mean, they, the same thing was true of, of tar sands. That They've known about those tar sands deposits yeah. since the 1940s. Mm -hmm. yeah, how like, do we get it out? But, yeah, yeah, it's like, how it's do we like, get it out? How do we make it profitable? And it wasn't until really the 80s and 90s where it even became feasible to think about the price was high enough, just like you were saying. The price started getting up high enough, and the technology was uh, getting better. So, you know, this this giant uh, deposit of oil that was previously really unusable all of a sudden became yeah, It's always been there, profitable. now it's worthwhile to go after it and the whole process of the horizontal fracking is just you know such a such a destruction you know it's, it's crazy to think that you can crack your earth and get all this gas out and it's not going to affect anything. And well it, it, <coughs> you know uh, as we're just saying it's, it might might not affect us here in Vermont because it's not in our backyard, but uh, we've got to have a larger view. I mean, but there are t businesses along the route, communities, homeowners who are looking forward to this and, and, and viewing it as a way to uh, get a cheaper fuel for heating their homes and, and such. And so how do you respond to, to those, uh, those folks who are thinking in that way? I, I try to educate them and realize that, you know, they need to kind of, you know, broaden the way they're thinking about this and do a little bit of research. You know, I try not to, to preach pe to people about what to do. It's like, get on the, on the web, you know, check the gas and oil industry, check, do some research on your own, you know, don't rely on what everybody else says. Mm -hmm. And as you start digging into it, you just find so many facts that, you know, that bring it up and say, wow, this is not such a good thing, you know, I mean, this gas pipeline is not, I mean, it seems like it's new, but this has been in the process for almost three years. Mm -hmm. And there was actually, there's been like seven different route possibilities down through the state. Two years ago, they had three routes down through Shalot, right down through Route 7. I have property there as well. And I was thinking, maybe it's time to hook up to gas. You know, it's clean, it's natural. You know, it's not until you start digging in, you find out no, it's named clean and natural. They're using those buzzwords, but it's not when you get into it. In terms of price, on. well, in terms of price, you know, the price is low right now because there's an abundance of, of gas that's available uh, without a lot of effort, without a lot of transport uh, involved. That is to say, in North America, there's a lot of gas that's currently available. But the price has been really volatile, and if you follow the pricing over, over the years, there's no reason to think that the level of uh, the current price is going to stay the same. As soon as that pipeline is in, as soon as people are hooked up to gas, as soon as there's no alternative, um, that, that, that price is going to go up. And, you know, and there's, there's that sort of third bottom line uh, uh, question too. It's like, what is the price? What's the price that we're paying for this gas in terms of, in terms of the fracking, in terms of the impact on, on the people where at the other end of the pipeline? And what's the impact on, on the earth as a whole? Yes. I mean, Vermont has a nice little thing going here. Yeah, where uh, we with try our, to you know, stay clean and No natural. fracking mm -hmm. and the right sustainable yeah. energy. And we, you know, we've got this, this comprehensive energy plan where we're going to get, you know, 90% of, of, uh, renewable, so-called renewable energy by 2050. But, you know, we're part of a global system. We're not, we certainly are. We're not isolated from, from the rest of the world. And if we're destroying the earth over there, um, it's not going to be different over here. Yeah. yeah so we're, we're hooked to the whole pipeline. You know, you have to look at the, from one end to the other. That's yes. part of globalization. You yes. know, we're all connected, you know. So there is, there is a short term, there is a potential short term gain. I mean, there's no denying that, you know, if you look at your bill this month and you look at your bill the next month once you've hooked up to natural gas, for a little while your bill is going to be lower. But, I mean, one of the problems in this country in general is that we, we do tend to think pretty short term. Really you know? short. And, um, 
And it's time to start thinking longer term mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what the impact is going to be, both on your pocketbook and on, on the planet. And you don't even have to look that far at the price of it. You know, it's like right now it's under $4 a million BTUs for natural gas. Before 2008, it was $14.80 right. per million BTU. So, I mean, that was only a few years ago. It was four times the price that it is now. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to think it's not going to go back to that. And you check their websites, like, you know, when we heard it was coming out of Western Alberta, I went to Western Alberta Gas and Oil Association and get on the website, of course, and Canada's the big producer up there. And here's a thing from the CEO saying, my goal for 2013 is to get the wholesale price of gas up 50%. Right. Well, what's that going to do to your 30% price that's advantage in the retail? Good for investors. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, exactly what they want. So, so we talked about the, the, how it affects uh, communities and land far away, um, but closer to home. One of the great concerns, this is how NOFA came into the issue, is uh, how will this pipeline affect mm -hmm. our agricultural lands? Will the soils be protected uh, from an organ from in terms of certified organic agriculture? There are standards that farmers need to uh, sort of live by. Mm -hmm. And if a pipeline company is coming through your property and digging up the land, what effect does that have on the soil, and how might that affect your <coughs> status as a certified producer? So, you've been that's your focus there, yeah, and the land, effects on the land. So tell us a little bit about how you see that, the problems and the concerns you have about that really on the ground kind yeah, of well, concern. A lot of it is, you know, just the attitude that they have, you know, it's like, you know, not everybody's connected to the land, you know, some people are and some people aren't. It doesn't make you a good person or a bad person, it's just the way you look at things. And the gas people just don't seem to have that connection at all. You know, it's just rocks and dirt. You know, you right. just dig a trench, put in a pipe, you know, throw a little grass seed on it, it'll be fine. But I see this having a lot of effect on the soil. You know, you're trying, especially when you're doing it organically, you know, you're trying to nurture your soil and give a good soil and have, you know, grow your soil so your, grow, so your soil will take care of you. And I mean, when you do this kind of damage and destruction, you're going to set back the soil by years you know i mean we called the extension service and talked to heather darby and said you know what do you think this is going to do and she said well you know and we sent her the weights of the of the equipment that we're going to go across and the amount of impact it was going to have and she says with your cl heavy clay soils it's probably going to set you back 10 years yeah easily hmm. yeah if it ever recovers so the, uh, the, the company is able to, if there's a certific certificate of public good issue, they can come in and sort of take the land by eminent domain. Oh, they're going to have to. Huh? And uh, with some compensation, but mm -hmm. not getting the compensation enough for destroying the soils. And they, there's a corridor that they will have control over, not only during the construction, but for, life. But for eternity, for eternity in, essentially. In yeah. And they'll have the opportunity to come in, not just during the construction phase, but to do any Anytime. kind of maintenance if there are leaks. If they need to yeah. put in a 24 inch pipe instead of it, they'll rip yeah. it up, put in another one. Yeah. So I know one concern we've had is, okay, so if you hold their hand during the construction process and make sure that uh, they're doing it right, what's, who's to say and what's to say that when they come in in the future, that same kind of care and, and sort of supervision yeah. will be there? And how they supervise it too. I mean, we, we had a meeting with Vermont Gas and one of our other neighbors and said, you know, like, what's going on? How are you dealing with this? And we said, how are you going to monitor this pipeline to make sure there's not an issue with it? They said, well, we kept check the pressure at the, at the main valve and we check at the gate valves. And if there's a loss, you know, we go out and see what's going on. And we walk the thing at least once a month and we fly over it. And everybody says, well, this is a gas. You know, you're not going to see a geyser coming up out of the ground. What are you looking for? They said, well, we're looking for the vegetation to turn yellow. And then we hone in on where there's a problem. Just what you a know? farmer wants to hear. Yeah, by the time your vegetation is, is turned yellow, and of course, this is Vermont, you know, we've got a few months where everything's dormant. So if there's a leak out there under the snow, <laughs> you know, that's going to go undetected. And, you know, the damage it's going to do to your soil, you know, I mean, it's going to wipe it right out. You know, we're on bottom land. I've got like 40 acre marsh that's in a WRP project and in the springtime it just it rocks with noise from all the all the, all the wildlife that's out there you know yeah, yeah. and it's just incredible and to think that you could put a pipeline right by it or through it 
and just destroy it with just a simple little accident is just ridiculous that anyone would even think of doing that in this day and age, you know? I mean, this is Vermont. We're supposed to care here, you know? And, and just, like with the, the land thing, you know, I look at the other end of the pipeline and, you know, I figured, well, somebody's making a big pile of money on their farm out where this comes from. Well, they said it's coming from Western Alberta. I didn't realize when you buy land in Western Alberta, you buy the topsoil. Yeah. And the government owns the mineral, mineral rights. rights. So if they find gas on your farm, you might get a new access road, you know, so that they can get there, but you get no benefit from it. You know, you get the bad water, you get the, the livestock issues, you know. I know one of the, uh, one of the things we've shared with the uh, gas company, and we'll share with the Public Service Board in the future when phase two begins and we file as, as, a, as a party, an interested party, is uh, organic farms are certified and they need to maintain an organic system plan. How will you treat the soil? Mm -hmm. How will you address concerns? How will you maintain those soils and build them yeah. in a process of continuous improvement? And this comes in and just sort of like puts a wound through the land. Exactly. And uh, we've been telling them, you, you are going to have to really step up. If, if, these, if this pipeline comes across certified organic land or land that may Even become if, certified, yeah. I mean, and there's a lot of organic land and, land and farmers who wish to become uh, certified in your neck of the woods, yeah. uh, how will you ensure that farmers will be able to comply with the organic system plan? And those in the future who have a pipeline under their ground and want to become organic, in the easements and in the contracts that, that companies develop with landowners, how will that process look? How will, uh, what will the supervision level be like? How will we be sure that they will respect the organic system plan? And, uh, you know, we've had a few ideas about what we would like to see yeah. in terms of, uh, uh, of an easement. Well, Enbridge uh, Corporation that, you know, as we were saying earlier, owns this or at least this partial ownership of this whole system that includes Vermont gas, they were uh, responsible for the spill in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the, the oil spill in Kalamazoo, Michigan. What happened there was that they had a drop in pressure, just like you were saying. In their control center, they, they registered a drop in pressure in their pipeline. And their understanding of drop in pressure is that what's likely to be happening is that there's an air bubble. So there's a... a so what, what they do when there's an air bubble is they increase the pressure oh, to yeah, push through right. the air bubble. So what they did is they increased the pressure from the control center, and for 17 hours, this pumped through at a higher pressure, pumping oil, a million gallons of oil, out into the Kalamazoo River. And it was only a, 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 a local utility worker that started noticing that there was something going on there, reporting it. Call and said, up. Boy, you got a right. big pile of goo coming out of your pipe here. <laughs> yeah. So when the National Transportation Safety Board did a report on this and Enbridge's response to it, and uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is primarily because this is Enbridge, you know, yeah, and yeah. we're talking mm -hmm. about the same corporation. They, they re referred to Enbridge's response to, uh, to the situation as akin to the Keystone Cops. It was so incompetent. It was so buffoonish. It was so not the right thing to do that, you know, when, when pipeline companies, when gas companies, when oil companies assure us of the safety and their concern for safety, I just point to those things, yeah. you know. It's like they don't care about our safety. They care about the bottom line, their bottom line, their profits. And they really are not going to assure that safety, even if they have, they can tell you all about their leak detection systems and, uh, you know, and they're monitoring it. It's just like Nate said, you know, it's like after it happens, what good was that leak mm -hmm. detection system that didn't quite yeah, work, yeah. you know? I mean, we stopped it eventually, but... I think it was five times they restarted the Kalamazoo pipeline before right. they finally caught on. You know, it's like, oh, it's not working. Let's just push more through it. And we'll be putting it underneath... Uh, Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain. Yeah. And, right. Uh, oh, that's perfectly safe. Don't yeah. Worry. And, of course, one of the big things that causes a problem here is this is liquid fuel. So if you have right. an oil spill, you see it. If you have a gas spill, nobody sees it. You know, yeah. it, you know, we were talking to some people in Heinsberg, and they said, what's your problem? I mean, even if you have a leak, it just goes up in the air, and it replaces the oxygen. It's like, wonderful. <laughs> you know, I don't well, need my oxygen. You know? plus, I'd rather plus, have an plus oil you're leak. you it with a greenhouse up. gas that's 23 times more potent it's, than carbon yeah. dioxide. Right. Uh, so, it's yeah, they, those folks need just, some uh, broader view, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, well, we're sort of, this is just the, 
tip of the iceberg in terms of all the complexities and such. Mm -hmm. But uh, it strikes me that you can have all the all the all the plans for response and detection in place, but at some point somebody makes a decision whether or not the, uh, the steps you should be taking now, the prudent steps, uh, are going to cost you so much money that it's not worth taking those steps yeah. right now. And or so even the levels of even the levels of technology that you're going to put in for the leak detection, you know, it's a it's a profit and loss decision. Yeah. It's a benefit. Yeah. Benefit decision, and you know they they there are technologies that are conceivable to uh, to create a leakless pipeline, whether it's oil or gas. But it's not profitable. It's not going to be profitable for them. So you know they tell you the two forty eight process. It's you know minimal impact. You know least adverse impact to who? You know from what point of view? Investors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure they're not. Their bottom line is more important than my bottom line. So, so, you know, the connection here to our energy future is, I guess we were talking about this earlier, I mean, we put a pipeline in, it has a life of decades, that and plan. we have made, we have poured investment into a fossil fuel energy system, and it just seems that it, to the extent that we invest in that and put all our eggs in that basket, we start to um, ignore or not have enough investment left over for alternative mm. energy and uh, a, a, an energy future that's more responsible in terms of greenhouse uh, gases and climate change. What would is that? That's your well, perspective. Well, of course, even you know, even if you accept the 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 faulty premise that uh, gas is is better for the environment than oil. Uh, that's really not true. But even if you accept that, we're still locking ourselves into a fossil fuel future and not, not looking at alternatives, not looking at, at efficiency, not looking at reducing demand, not looking at, at uh, trying to find low impact renewable energy sources. Um, you know, once that money is invested, once the society as a whole is investing in uh, in, in an infrastructure, whether it's uh, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline in the Midwest, whether it's you know this Energy East pipeline that they're talking about in Canada, or the or the natural gas pipeline, that commitment is made. That is the decision, not just by the company to do that, but it's a, a decision by the, by the society to go in that direction. Yes, you know if they're going to go ahead and build a pipeline, saying that it is a bridge fuel, there should be a termination point. You know, it's like we have what 15 years to get climate change under control before we're over the tipping point. Or this should be a build out for five years, 10 years, and you need to factor that in. Okay, are we going to spend $80 million and then rip this pipe out in five years? How, how is the finances of that? And you should look at that and then say, well, maybe it's not so profitable to and do we this. Should, we should point out, though, also, that it's not just an investment by International Paper, by Vermont <laughs> Gas in this pipeline. It's a, it's a public investment mm. because um, Vermont Gas was supposed to give a rebate to customers of, of what was it, $70 million? And so instead of doing that, the Public Service Board said, no, you can just invest that in your infrastructure. So this is a public investment as well as, mm -hmm. as a private investment. And the landowner investment, I mean, the landowners are getting the burden of this and we're not getting the money out of it that mm. you should get. I mean, if they had to actually go out and buy the land and pay the taxes on it, you know, and take care of it, it'd be a whole different ball game. They wouldn't be able to afford to do this. So know? with so many things in our society, we have a sort of a false counting yeah. system Very for, false. for the uh, full impact and costs. And if you spread it over time, it doesn't make sense at mm. all. It makes sense short term for investor returns. Yeah. Rising, uh, rising Tide Vermont that's been very involved in this organizing around the pipeline and has been you know, supporting landowners and supporting other people. They like to talk about false solutions and this is mm -hmm, definitely mm -hmm, one of those false mm -hmm. solutions. Yeah, it's hard for people to get their uh, heads around that. I mean, it's a different kind of personal accounting as well mm -hmm. that you have to get comfortable with. Things you can't see. It comes down to really, uh, I think, how much do you care about people who are mm. affected by your own decisions, near and far, yeah. and the earth. Well, okay. people, are, people are struggling, you know, I mean, there's yeah. no question that, that people are struggling. They're trying to pay their bills, they're trying to uh, balance their accounts, they're trying to get through and feed their kids and get yes. their kids through school. I mean, you know, when somebody offers them a, a cheaper alternative for, for in the short term, that looks pretty good. Of course. It's hard not to want to jump up, I mean, and, and 
people have had so much struggle for so long, and we've gone through a heck of an economic downturn, you know, I mean, yeah. everybody's looking to cut corners, you know, this seemed like a good thing. It's clean, it's natural, it's cheap, you know? It's like, why wouldn't you think that's a good thing? It's not until, you know, a few people start looking at it going, wait a minute, let's look at some of these other angles, you start, you know, and it's hard for a lot of people that are, you know, it's like, I know it's cheaper now, you know. I know it'll be more expensive later, but it's cheaper now. It's yeah. like, come on, right. look beyond year one, two. Right. Look down the road. So, um, so um, as, as we said at the top, the Public Service Board, a, a government body, is charged with taking a look at the um, overall uh, attributes of this and deciding whether it should go forward and issue a certificate of public good. Now, Nate and other, or, uh, other individuals in the phase one Aspect, pro, uh, phase one of this project have intervened in the, with the Public Service Board, have filed testimony. There's been a lot of back and forth. And in uh, September, the Public Service Board will have some hearings about all of these technical aspects and some decision on phase one in terms of the route and whether or not there'll be a certificate of public good, considering all the things we've been talking about and, and more, is going to be November, uh, at which time the phase two project will also s start to bootstrap and, and get going and there'll be uh, parties that intervene in that process, lots of testimony over the next year or more. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the status of the uh, approval process. Uh, so what actions can people take now? What, it, what is being done? You mentioned Rising Tide. I know they have a web page. Yeah, they have a web page. They're trying to, you know, gain momentum and get people aware of what's going on, get them out to the meetings. You know, you need to really talk to the public service uh, department and give your comments there and let them know your concerns and, you know, because that's basically supposedly your your advocacy group that's, yes. you know, bringing up the, the, the uh, local people's uh, concerns and they really need to hear from more people, a lot of people, that you know, this isn't the way to go. It's not so, good for the humans, not good for the dogs. So there are, there are people who can formally intervene and participate in the public service board process and then pub, the public can always send in comments. You can and, send in comments in order to intervene you have to be directly yeah. impacted as a And label. they decide whether or not your interests are such that yeah. you, you, you would be approved as an intervener. Yeah. But anyone can get on the public service board page and submit a comment about yeah, this. It, it is, but you know, it's not, as, as people in the Northeast Kingdom found when they were trying to oppose the industrial wind turbines uh, in the last few years, that the public service board process is pretty broken in terms yeah. of public mm -hmm. participation. So, so Nate and Jane can intervene as landowners um, and corporations can intervene uh, like International Paper is, a, is an intervener yes. and uh, you know, <coughs> other, other corporations, but it's pretty hard for the public to get in. It's a mm. co so-called quasi-judicious, judicious, uh, what judicial, are we? Judicial. judicial, I'm yeah. okay. stuck on judicious. Quasi-judicious too. Mm -hmm. Quasi-judicial <laughs> process. And, and, you know, that doesn't have a lot of in. Yeah. You know, where we really have, I mean, we certainly, we certainly should be putting comments in. And Rising Tide Vermont, if you go to their website or the Stop Vermont Gas website, you know, you can, you can sign a petition, you can, you can send a postcard, uh, you can register your comment, and that's a really good thing to do. But we also need to be putting pressure on uh, the legislature and on uh, the public service department, which is supposed to be representing the public in this process, mm -hmm. um, which is different from the public service board, and, and really get them to do a deeper analysis of, of the project. You know, they submitted testimony recently, and we went down, a group of us down, to a demonstration at the public service department a few weeks ago because mm -hmm. with a big rubber stamp. You know, because what they seem to be doing is rubber stamping this project. And we offered him this rubber stamp and said, here, you know, you might as well have this because that's what you're doing. And, uh, and you know, it was just a graphic demonstration of the fact that they're not doing the analysis that, that is really necessary to represent the public good in this process. And, you know, they, they, they filed testimony where basically they said, this doesn't have much impact. You know, and they weren't even doing a, a life cycle analysis of what the... Uh, of what what the impact yeah. would be, yeah. you know. So people need to, to to certainly connect with with the public service board in terms of comment. And there's a there's a meeting that was supposed to be on September 11th and is now and changed now to September 10th yeah. in Middlebury, where where we'll definitely be trying to mobilize a lot of people to come to that meeting. 
on September 10th. How can people get more information about that meeting and about the action you just uh, Again, uh, the, the Rising Tide Vermont website is a, is a great source for that. Stop and Vermont the Gas. 350 has it listed on yours. And you? on 350 yeah. Vermont, for sure. 350VT.org is another, is another source for that. And we'll put it up on our webpage. That's, That's part of the problem is they've done a real good job of kind of sliding it through without a lot of publicity. You know? right. so. so the challenge right now is to get people informed, get, educated, yeah. And, uh, and to identify a way that they can become engaged mm -hmm. here at this stage in mm -hmm. this phase one process, mm -hmm. and then just carry on into phase two with, uh, with engagement and activism. I think in the engagement and activism is going to do probably more than anything else, because the way the 248 process is set up, it's just ridiculous. You know, when we first got involved when the scheduling hearing was done, one of the members of the board said, you, what you should do if you're seriously thinking about intervening, and this is a big deal, you know, because it's not something to take lightly, is you should go to the Public Service Department and look at some of the previous uh, things that have gone through the 248 process mm -hmm. and get an idea on how it's done and how it works, because mm -hmm. you know, they give you a little, you know, 10-page citizens right. guideline on how to yeah, go but through that's it. that's not really the way. Yeah, so <laughs> I called him up and I said, so I want to look at some of the previous cases and uh, they said, well, I'm not sure what, which ones you'd want to look at. I said, well, I want to look at the, the, the ones where the people win. Because, <laughs> well, you don't actually win in the process. You know, you might get there some... There are no winners and yeah, losers here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you might get some attachments to their permit so that, you know, right. you get what, you, something that you want, but you, you won't win. It's like... Wow, now that's the way to start a process. This is the way to uh, encourage engagement, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and you know, you talk to lawyers that deal with the 248 process, you know, and there was a, one of the other firms that was looking at hiring an attorney, and the attorney said, well, look, I'm going to take $150,000 of your money, and you're still going to have a pipeline. You want to go ahead? Because <laughs> you're not going to win this. It's like, whoa. That However, there you have been... Uh, you can get changes to the root, and you get alterations, and you can get some considerations. The way this, this, this system is set up, it basically is set up for the utility to get what they want. So we've got challenges in terms of engaging with this in the near term, with this pipeline, and then longer term political challenges to get the Public Service Department and the legislature engaged in fixing this process. Okay. Uh, particularly if, 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 if you know, the, the, the word is that no matter how engaged you are, you're still going to lose, so that's why I that's, got into uh, it myself. We don't want to end on a cynical note. Yeah. But, no. uh, um, well, thank you both very much for being here. I think, you know, Anytime. It's, I... a, it's a continuing story. We'll be continuing to, to engage with it from, uh, in terms of representing our, our uh, farmers. They and, definitely uh, need representation. <laughs> and, you know, we just have, a, uh, we have an interest in the bigger picture as well, and I know you, you two will be... This will be your life uh, extending uh, into uh, months and I hope not years ahead. But uh, thanks for all your good work yeah. and thanks for being here. And thanks for having us. People start telling you this is a, a bridge, just think of gangplank. <laughs> you step <laughs> off the end, it's a plunge. <laughs> okay, so this is Dave Rogers and um, thank you for watching and um, we'll be doing more of these chats in the future.